You're listening to a podcast by and for fans of the San Francisco Giants with hosts Willie Dills, Chad King, and Ben Lee. Let's go, Giants! SF Giants! Let's go, Giants! SF Giants! Dedicated to the greatest team in Major League Baseball history, the San Francisco Giants, this is Torture Cast. Welcome everybody to the Torture Cast podcast by and for fans of the San Francisco Giants. This is episode 47, the Rod Beck episode. My name is. Ah, screw it. I'm jumping out the window. <laughs> <laughs> I really do feel like jumping out the window. <laughs> Why the long voice, Willie? My name, my name is Willie Dills, by the way. I'm joined, of course, by Chad King. Uh, welcome, Chad. I'm not going to ask how you're doing, because I think we all know the answer to that. <laughs> I think we all know how we're all doing right now. This is a Giants podcast. The Giants podcast, buying four fans of the San Francisco Giants, the greatest team in Major League Baseball history. Unfortunately, we're also all fans of the Golden State Warriors. And uh, the Warriors were winning by 18, 18 in the fourth. Yeah. And uh, found a way to lose in double overtime. Um, just crushing, crushing loss tonight. And uh, so many, we could we could probably talk for an hour about this game. We could probably talk for an hour about the last four minutes of this game. Uh, but uh, It's hard to believe that you and I could get three other guys and still blow an 18-point lead with a few minutes left. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I could just go in there and I could just hustle on defense and do something. I, mean, I wouldn't be able to score, time. but yeah. But anyway, I, you know, just honestly, the Warriors down the stretch... I'll just say this. First of all, we saw um, we saw a little bit of odd refereeing towards the end there, um, but I won't blame that for this loss. What I will blame for this loss is the fact that the Warriors decided to stop playing basketball at the end of this game. I, I don't know what plays they were calling. They were basically calling no movement ISOs, mm-hmm. and the entire game, the reason we had such a big lead was moving the ball running screens, you know, uh, getting wide open looks and playing hustling defense and getting rebounds. And then suddenly the very end of this game, first of all, Bo gets not in the game. I don't, I can't wrap my head around that. And, uh, you've also got to, you know, you got Clay Thompson fouling out on some really stupid calls. I mean, and also just not smart play by him anyway, just to have a, a, a call be, be even an option. But, uh, yeah, all know. I can say, it was really conservative play calling. I think it's the equivalent of just running the ball with a big lead in the NFL and maybe playing a little zone defense when that team's down by three touchdowns and they yeah. can sneak back on you. But the problem is, is that there's not like, you know, the Hail Mary in this game. It's no. just, you know, one play at a time. Yeah. And it really didn't make sense the way that they were heading those last three minutes. No, with, with eight minutes left, they started to basically play not to lose, you know, and yeah. that's too much time left. You still got to keep playing. You got to play the yeah. game that got you to that lead. And, you know, I, I'm not sure why after the way they closed out all these games in Denver, they didn't learn their lesson yet. But uh, if they haven't learned their lesson by now, then they're just not going to learn it. I mean, and I, I got to put all the onus on Mark Jackson on this one. Like, I, I think as great of a coach as he's actually been for us, he's also really mismanaged some games down the stretch. And, uh, there's been some times where I'm really confused about the team he's putting out on the floor. You know, I, I don't understand why he went away from the, the team that got him that lead. You know, and he went to this new line, this very small lineup that was just kind of getting uh, physically dominated there towards the end. Uh, but anyway, I, you know, and, and if uh, if we can say anything about this game, we can say that we at least prove that we can take it to the Spurs if we play the way we're supposed to play. Yeah, but I thought for sure that they were going to snap that losing streak that they've had since, what, yeah. 1998? 1997, I think it was. They are saying 
that yeah, uh, I thought it was in the bag, but yeah, they were saying clearly, that, I think Mark Jackson thought the same thing. Yeah, they're saying Tim Duncan was was in college the last time that the <laughs> Warriors won a game in San Antonio. So, but yes. it's just it was just ugly all the way around there in the fourth quarter. But well, uh, it, was a, it was a distraction from the Giants last. I night, actually but. barely watched it. I had so I had the Warriors game on my TV, and then I streamed the the Giants game and had that on the projector. But uh, it was I could barely pay attention. I'll, I'll, you know, not only that, but the fact that the Giants were down, you know, three nothing, then three one, then four one, uh, four one, five two. You know, it was like and yeah, against Cliff Lee. Cliff too, Lee so. was just pitching yeah. out of his mind tonight, so just didn't look like the Giants were going to be able to come back in this one. Even though the Giants have proven that they can basically come back no matter what, um, and that's one thing that I think we can all feel pretty damn good about. When we last did this podcast, we had just lost, or yeah, we just lost five in a row. Right, uh, and that was a week ago. The podcast took a little bit of time to come out. I'm sorry about that. Everybody who heard it understands why it didn't come out that night. But the fact that it didn't come out the next day is just because uh, you know I I had the file up on the computer, uploaded it, and the upload failed, and I went to work, and so yeah. I didn't get to come back and actually get in front of my computer at home for like another day and a half almost. So finally got that show up. Really glad to have had Eric Nathanson on the show. He was a great guest, and yeah, we had was. a really good time. So uh, and then. We win. We move on, and we win six in a row. So uh, let, let's just feel good about that. So you're that. welcome, Giants. Yeah. So yeah. So Eric Nathanson clearly had something to do with that. Uh, oh, but let's course. let's feel good about that in the, in the wake of this uh, crushing Warriors defeat. A um, couple of notes about that six game winning streak. Uh, it's a good way to erase five game losing streaks. First of all, is go ahead and just sweep two teams in a row. But not only that, now we have swept every single team in the National League West. Yeah, isn't that strange? Um, and it's, it's we're May. very May. early in the season. Yeah. We're, what, five weeks in now? Five, yeah. I think five weeks in. So to have swept all four of the other teams in your division, first of all, I think that gives you a mental edge that you can do that. You can, you can stomp on all these teams if you need to. Um, and they know that they can get stomped on by the Giants. So I think going into the rest of the season, that has to give you a good feeling, right? Um, you know the Dodgers. We just own them right now, and the, obviously they're having they're a little bit of a hard luck team. They lost nine to two tonight too against the mm-hmm, to Arizona. Arizona. So you know they're just they're just going through it right now. And uh, you know I like to be happy when the Dodgers are struggling, but I didn't like to see Hanley Ramirez get hurt. You know I don't like to see that type of st- I don't like to see Granky. I don't like to see all these things happen. I would like to see the Giants. Uh, play against you the full, beat the full squad. Yeah. yeah, you don't want you don't want to beat the uh, injured squad, but yeah. you know. And I'm fully, I, I fully believe that the Giants are capable of beating the Dodgers at full strength. Um, you know, I think I think a lot of people probably think you match these two teams up just talent wise. The Dodgers have the edge, but I really think that the Giants do have an edge as far as overall uh, team capabilities. I guess you could say not just raw talent, but uh, the way the Giants have the pieces in place. I think they are a stronger team overall. So. Um, good to see the Giants starting to play good again. And there's a couple of reasons why they're starting to play good, and we're going to get into that when we start talking about the, the rest of the week in review. But uh, let's talk about where we're at right now. Uh, so we are in first place, right? Half a game ahead of Colorado? Half game, yeah. And uh, second best record in the National League even after yeah, the loss tonight? I had to correct that. It actually, after the loss third tonight, best. it did drop to third. St. Louis and Atlanta do have better winning percentages, but hey. They're, they're up there. So for everybody who was crying after losing five games, you know, you win six out of seven, and boom, you're top three in the NL. So yeah, you're right bad. back in there. And, and you know, let's let's point out where we were last year. You compiled this. So 32 games in. Where were we last year at this time? Two games under 500 at 15 and 17. And, of course, the Dodgers were hot last year at the early part of the season. We were six games behind L.A., and here we are sitting a half game ahead. So that's a and six and a half game difference already. Let's point out a couple of things too. The Dodgers had ungodly Kemp and ungodly Ethier last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Giants, on the other hand, had pretty much no one playing um, beyond their capabilities at the start. But we have a much worse ERA right now at this point from our starting staff than we did at this point last year. Yes, and yet we are. Far in a far better position as far as the record goes in the standings in the National League West. So, to me, that says first of all, Dodgers aren't playing and, at an ungodly level. But second of all, that the Giants' offense is capable of uh, holding up a, a pitching staff that is not performing to its capabilities. So, you know, this is a huge sign for us that if the pitching staff can actually pull it together, if these guys can pitch the way they're capable of, and you know, Matt Cain won his first game yesterday. 
Um, <laughs> Isn't that crazy? The opening day starter, our quote unquote ace, won his first game in his seventh start or sixth start. Yeah, and yeah, seventh. And you know he had a, he's had a couple of actually really good games. I mean, you you talk about opening day, he pitched uh, what almost eight innings, one run ball. Uh, you know, basically Kershaw beats him single handedly in that game, but mm-hmm. still he had some very terrible games in that in that stretch as well. But uh, he has pitched well enough to win a couple of games, but it just didn't take until, you know, May. So it's pretty. It's a pretty phenomenal stat to think about that, and think about the fact that we're not only are we in it, but we're up. You know, I mean, we're we're up on everybody else. And uh, the Rockies had a really hot start, and we're above them now. So, you know, I think I think as Giants fans, we have to feel pretty damn good about what's going on right now with our team. And I mean, offensively, I think some people are starting to click. So, Panda has actually really come around. Um, he, he was never really faltering necessarily, but he's really started to kind of find that stroke from both sides of the plate right now. And there's some really interesting <laughs> no stats. No matter where the ball is pitched. <laughs> yeah, there's some really interesting stats with him. One, that he has a much higher batting average on balls out of the strike zone than anybody else in baseball. Yeah. And he actually has a higher average on balls out of the strike zone than balls in the strike zone, which is just weird. But he, there's also, I think, the fact that I don't think he sees balls in the strike zone unless... Um, unless it's like, you know, a 3-1 count or maybe an, an 0-2 count and he gets nibbled, basically. I, I don't think anyone's throwing him strikes. And so he's just not seeing strikes, so it's just kind of, that's just what he's dealing with. And uh, it's just, he's a funky player. God, God love him. Uh, but he's, you know, he's really, really trying, kind of showing us all what he's, what he's capable of when he's swinging yeah, back you know, good. A couple years ago, I used to get upset, at, you know, at him when I see him uh, swing out of the strike zone. But uh, boy, you bring up that stat right there, and you just can't. You no, just you can't. can't. This is how he plays baseball, and you know, it's 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 not the way you're going to teach anybody to play baseball. But some guys just kind of have that. Some guys have that ability I mean, to do things that no one else can do. If you're going to get mad at Panda for swinging at balls outside of the strike zone, you might as well get mad at Hunter Pence for the way he throws a ball. Yeah, exactly. Over your shoulder, buddy. <laughs> the hand goes above the shoulder. Yeah, but it doesn't. You know, it doesn't seem to matter. I mean, when he threw out. No, granted, Hanley Ramirez pulled up lame about halfway down the, the line between mm-hmm. second and third. But still, that was a fantastic throw. And you look at Matt Kemp's throw that got Buster Posey, uh, and Matt Kemp has a much more traditional throwing style and mm-hmm. looks like a guy who was trained correctly at a young age and everything. And he floated that ball down to home plate, and just because of the, of the extreme slowness of Posey, that's why Posey got out, got thrown out. But uh, you know, I mean, I love seeing a guy like Hunter Pence play baseball, and he's just phenomenal. Right now, he's absolutely crushing the ball. I mean, he's just raking everything. Um, that ball he hit in Arizona was absolutely mammoth—460 feet of yeah. pure muscle. I yeah. don't know, he just muscled that sucker out of there it was insane with a with a good two inches that he chokes up on that bat too Mm -hmm. and he somehow finds the power to do that kind of stuff so you know how strong this guy is but also we got scudero coming around i think he's hit safely now in seven out of his last eight games yeah coming into tonight i think he was uh four for his last five so yeah he's been heating up and we honestly all we really need out of this guy for a full year i mean we're not going to get 362 but we if we get 280 out of this guy out of the two hole with the professional at bats he puts on um, he's he's going to be a huge factor for us for an entire season. So I'm really really happy to see that you know the slump was just a slump and it wasn't just oh my god we made a bad signing and we got this guy for three years and he's not worth it you know and stuff like that. I think I don't think any of us really thought that, but obviously there was a little bit of talk of that and there's a little bit of concern when a guy starts out that cold after you just gave him a contract. So right. good to see him coming around and then of course Posey is kind of turning back into regular Posey at this point. Um, now, none of us assumed he was going to slump the rest of the season or anything like that. But, you know, it, it was we were all just kind of waiting, waiting, waiting. And, uh, you know, when he when he started hitting the ball again, I think everybody said, OK, all right, now I'm feeling good. And uh, the ball he hit, uh, the ball he hit in the ninth inning against the Dodgers. Um, God, that was just a thing of beauty, man. It was it was like I went out. I, we were at Hockey Haven watching that game. Oh, we're here. And uh, and that's a bar uh, in the Richmond. It's like right across the street from Balboa Theater. And it's you know it's funny because it's called Hockey Haven, and the Sharks have a playoff game on. One TV is on the Sharks playoff game. 
all the rest of the TVs in the place and the sound is the Giants game. So you you got to know like that this this is a baseball town all the way. Even a bar called Hockey Haven is you know, and that was a really good, uh, good Sharks game. The Sharks scored with one minute left and an empty goal. Um, so I mean, it was a crazy game for them too. But uh, you know, it was just it was a really fun game to watch. I mean, watching Zito go up against Kershaw, anybody's going to pencil that in as a win for the Dodgers, you know, and. Um, you know, Zito pitched him strong. Zito got all the way through into the, I think he got into the seventh or the eighth and uh, yeah. kept it close. Just one run. Kept it close. And then the ninth inning, you know, guess who's leading off? Buster Posey. That's not a bad guy to start off an inning. And uh, he just tattoos one into the left field bleachers. So uh, it, was, it was that was just one of the funnest games of the season for me. Followed up by maybe the best game I've seen in since maybe, I, you know, since the playoffs for sure. But, I mean, maybe one of the best games I've ever seen. Uh, especially for a Giants Dodgers game, where it was just back and forth, back it and was forth. A classic. Yeah. Giants were up five nothing. Then they're down uh, what seven five or something like that. Come yeah, they back. went up uh, five nothing, and then they were still up six one, and then go down eight to six. Eight to six, and then it becomes eight to eight, then nine to eight Dodgers, then nine nine, yep. and then guess who? The other catcher. Uh, Guillermo Carreras comes up and uh, tattoos a ball and knew it instantly. I mean, he hit that ball and immediately started cheering. I mean, he knew. He must have just, you know, peered that ball because as soon as he let go of the bat, he was pumping his fists and everything. And it was really cool to see him get into the action. I mean, it was weird, though, was that was Posey's first walk-off hit. Yep. And that's that very strange first walk-off hit in the major leagues. And that's yeah. very, very strange to think about as the guy who you kind of expect. But, I mean, also, you got to think about – uh, he's the guy that will get pitched very carefully in walk-off situations. So mm-hmm. uh, that's kind of one of his only real opportunities to do that is unless, like, you know, you got bases juiced or you got first and second or you got bases empty. You know, I mean, those are the only times he's really going to see pitches to hit. So uh, it's really, really good. You, you know who leads the Giants this year in walk-off hits? Do you know right offhand? Oh, God, offhand. Uh, no, I don't. It's Brandon Belt. I think Brandon Bell has done it now. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Three yeah. times, I think. And the Giants have done it collectively 11 times now. Um, walked off the field with a win. And that's right. that's nuts. Again, five weeks into the season. We've seen some really, really strange baseball up to this point. Yeah, they're but, coming the A's of last year. Yeah. But, uh, so the Giants are doing some weird stuff. The offense is clicking. The pitching's still not there. But I think we all have to feel pretty good about where we are at this point in the year. Uh, especially, you know, considering uh, what's happening around the rest of the National League West. I mean, I don't see the Dodgers, at least for the next two months maybe, until everybody gets healthy, um, putting together any kind of significant run at us. So, You know, like you said, the offense is carrying the pitching right now. We're 10th in the ERA. It was better than last week. It was second to last just a week ago. So it shows you how a young season, the stats can change very quickly. Oh, absolutely. But number two in average behind the Rockies, and any time the Rockies lead, one of these offensive categories, you just kind of throw it away because you're like, yeah, yeah, it's Colorado, whatever, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and they're second, no, third in runs. So wow. I mean, they're doing really well. Yeah, yeah, so they're scoring runs, and that's that's the really the only stat that matters is runs scored. So, um, All right, so let's talk about the big question. Obviously, we just talked about the pitching, but there's one guy in particular <clears throat> that uh, we do need to talk about, and that's because he really hasn't had a single solid start yet. Um, well, I, str- I struggled with this. I, I filled in Vogelsong again because we talked about it last week, a little bit mm-hmm. of Kane, but mostly Vogelsong. So I don't mean to beat a dead horse here, but as far as big questions on the team, the offense is doing really well right now. Comeback wins. Kane's turning it around. He's lowered his ERA in three consecutive starts. He got his first win, seven shutout innings. The other pitchers are holding their own. Well, Lincecum uh, bull- has had a couple of good starts now. So Yeah, the bullpen's know. been you know pretty solid. So he's really the big question mark out of the 25-man roster. Yeah. Absolutely the big question mark right and now. And even if we talked about it last week, I mean, it's it, this hasn't the issue has not gone away. He He's, you know, kind of continued. His starts are basically all the same. They're all about giving up four, five, six runs and not being able to. It's You know what it seems to me? I don't see him walking a ton more guys than he used to, but it's like he's just not... Like, when he's missing, he's missing in the middle of the zone, not off the yeah. corners down low. He's just missing right down the middle. And these yeah, guys are breaking him. average against his 315 now, okay. which is that's that's just never going to work. Awful. Yeah, that's never going to work. And you look at Tim Linskin when he struggled, the batting average against was still very low. It was just the walks. So Vogelsong yeah. is just throwing up 
you know, he's just throwing BP to these guys. And, uh, you know, we're all rooting for him, man, but, geez, I, I don't know. It's it's so early that you can't really make a decision about it yet. You can't uh, no, pull No, no, some... it's way too early for that. Yeah. You know, and guys on Cam Bear are calling in, calling for his head and saying, you got to put him in the bullpen. And then the host is bringing up the obvious point. Who the hell are you going to put in his place? Yeah, there's nobody. You know, there's nobody who has the tenure or the experience. You know, that, that he does. You can't just throw a random triple A or anyone in the bullpen up there. Hey, let's throw in Runzler. Let's throw in, you know, this guy and just see how they do. You just, you just can't do that. No, so I, I, I think agree. he's just got to work it out. I think you got to give him till I'm all star break. Yeah, no, if, he, if he's still season. struggling with the all-star break, you got to consider. But I think what you do is you make a move and bring in somebody from, from the outside. I, I, there's yeah. nobody that we can just bring up that's going to fix this problem. So it's way too early to start knee-jerk reactions. It's way too early to start panicking. Um, we've seen Vogelsong struggle. He struggled towards the end of last year, and he found a way to get it done in the playoffs. So, you know, he's, he's definitely – if anybody's worked through adversity and gotten through it, it's this guy. So while he may be struggling right at this very moment – I, th I say, you know, let's mix an armchair manager in here. I'm going to tell Bruce Bochy to just stick with this guy, let him work through his stuff, let Rags get in there into the bullpen with him, uh, you know, him and Gardner and Rags and everybody just work it out. You guys figure it out because I think they're all smart enough that they know what's going on here. And uh, it's just you got to you got to paint those corners like that's where you found your success was painting the corners with the fastball, and he's got to figure out a way to get back to that, whether it's mechanical, whether it's confidence, whether it's mental. I, you know, He's got to find that, that way to fight through this situation. Yeah, so. I think a good, a good thing or a good exercise for me would be to look at his heat map of where you know, hit balls are being uh, thrown in the strike zone, where balls are missing, to see mm -hmm. if there's any difference from last year because yeah. that might be a good point. He just might be nibbling, and it's just sliding across. It's, he's just missing his corners, and instead it's catching too much plate, and that might explain the batting average of balls in play and just the the batting average against. I mean, his velocity is down about a mile an hour, but I'm not going to say that's the problem. Yeah, that's but that's happened. Problem. That's happened to so many pitchers, and, and that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. if your if your velocity goes down a mile or so, you know your other pitches probably go down a mile or so too. So you're just you you're mixing that in. The speed differential is still the same. You know, so I I don't think that that's what's the cause either. I think it's it's got to be just where he's spotting these balls is just not where he was last year. So we're going to give him some time. And in the interest of doing a short show, we're going to move right on. Take to, it easy, uh, buddy. Yeah, do take it. it easy. You got this, buddy. So now we're going to do Tweet At Me Bra, and uh, I got one here. This is from uh, somebody who follows us. I kind of want to start doing some of these with people who follow us just because, you know, it's, if they follow us, the chances are good they might listen to us. And it's good to give them a little shout-out to our followers. We don't have a lot of them. So uh, King Eyeball King tweeted at us <laughs> at TortureCast. Walk off homer in the bottom of the 10th, or as the Giants call it, just another day at the yard. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's really how it's been feeling lately. Um, it's, you know, it's every single time it happens, it's amazing. Yeah, at this point, it's almost like we expect it, you know. Uh, we expect spoiled, the amazing. You know? Oh, I'm absolutely feeling spoiled. I mean, so I watch a hockey hit, and then I go to Kilowatt the next night and get to do it all again with a, gra a brand new group of guys who I've never met in my life. I get to go hug and high-five a bunch of people. And uh, it's fantastic. I love doing it. So, you know, big shout-out to everybody who's tweeting at us, and we're tweeting out. And, you know, this is exciting stuff, and I'm glad to be, like, right in the thick of things with this team right now. Uh, it's, just, it's just so fun. What do you got, Chad? So this is a little silver lining to the Warriors game tonight. Wendy Thurm, otherwise known as Hanging Sliders, tweeted out, and this is right after the game, well, at least the Dodgers will be in last place in a few minutes, so there's that. <laughs> there is that. Friend of the show, so, Wendy Thurm. And I was Thank like, you. really? Oh, I had actually confirmed that. I had not realized they had been sliding down that much. They've lost five in a row. They are below the below San Diego the Padres. Padres. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> they are literally in last place right now. Wow, that is terrible. Giants in first, Dodgers in last. Doesn't get much better than that. No, that's that's where it's supposed to be. All is right with the world. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, all right, that's pretty cool. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take that. To, I'm gonna have dreams about that tonight. I'm not gonna think about the Warriors. No. Warriors are only down 0-1. It's all good. Hey, I tell it's you what. Good. At least I'm way more of a baseball fan than a basketball fan. If this was the equivalent of the Giants in, let's say, the NLCS blowing an eight-run lead in the ninth inning. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. you know, you gotta you gotta also say that the the Warriors are are completely out distancing all expectations of them. You know, oh, they're I mean, gaining a lot of national media attention, yeah. and Curry is obviously a bit of a rising star right now. Yeah, but I mean, no one expected them to contend. Period. So to have already beaten the Nuggets and to now 
have gone up 18 to the Spurs, and yeah, we lost the game, but I think everybody's kind of realizing, okay, these guys are actually potentially for real. Um, now, can they close games? That's the next question. All right, new favorite guy. Chad starts right. off. Little Hunter Pence action because of that lumberjack swing he took in Arizona. He had, an, uh, he, uh, had another bomb tonight, went three for five. So he's picking it up, but he's showing no signs of the discomfort or uneasiness or maybe he was trying to do too much last year. Uh, none of that seems to be um, manifesting itself in his performance. He's hitting 280 right now, raking the ball, knocking him in. He's got his bombs and his doubles. So I think he's he's on he's on base to hit. You know, 25, 30 home runs this year. If he hovers around 270, 280, this is the guy we uh, thought we were getting. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, it's so, yeah, funny. He's my new favorite guy. I read. Uh... Uh, somebody tweeted something out about the Phillies. And eats a lot of kale. Yeah, a ton of kale. Uh, kale, Brussels sprouts, all that stuff. But uh, somebody tweeted something out um, uh, about the Phillies or, or I was in uh, Reddit or something. But I went over to a blog post from someone on SB Nation who's a Phillies writer. Uh, first of all, this blog post was full of typos and horrible grammar. Mm. But it was basically all about how much he hates the Giants. Um, just all about how much he hates the Giants. Just can't stand the Giants. And obviously, from the tone of his article, the Phillies and their fans are extremely bitter about Hunter Pence. And I don't think that they'd be bitter just about Hunter Pence coming to another team, because obviously, I mean, that's part of baseball. I think it's the way that Hunter Pence embraced this team when he got here. You know, I mean, I always kind of thought he really liked being in Philadelphia. Um, that's the way it seemed at the time. Mm -hmm. But I'm starting to get the feeling maybe he secretly just couldn't stand it because, I mean, Phillies fans are kind of notoriously rough, right, on their team, on the yeah, guys on their team. And uh, when things are going good, they're they're great, right? But when things aren't going so good, that's a tough place to play. And uh, the fact that he was just so excited to be on this team, I think there's something to that. I think uh, I think there's something to how it was for him in Philly that maybe we didn't all know. And he's just really happy to be in a place that's just going to support him all the time. And we supported him all through last year when he was not playing well. And we, we still found a way to have him become like a hero. A, no one was ever booing him when he was no. hitting 210 or 215. No, nobody booed him at all. We you like, the looked guy. up the board and you're like, oh, he's only hitting 215 with it. Oh, whatever. Yeah. You know, but he also found a way to knock in runs, so it's all yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, I just, I just got to say, like, I know some Phillies fans that are really cool guys, but there's something about those people, man. I just, they, they, they have such such hate in their hearts you know <laughs> they just hate everything and everybody and uh i guess when you're the losingest team in the history of the sport maybe that's what fosters that a little bit but uh you know they got a good team again they should be happy yeah, their, yeah. their team is actually i mean with the additions of uh the two youngs they got delman young now playing right field and they got michael young playing third base and i and definitely added some pop back into their lineup for them and I don't know. They look to me like a scary team again. So I got to give a shout out to Kevin Franzen, who of course is uh, That's right. on the roster this year, and he tweeted out that he was uh, obviously coming back to AT and T Park. He grew up in San Jose. He was a huge fan of the Giants, and it's actually pretty cool following him on Twitter, going back and looking at a lot of his photos. He's a major Sharks fan. He actually took a photo of one of those um, "This is Sharks territory." metal signs in his full Phillies uniform sitting on the Phillies logo on <laughs> Veterans Stadium. Like oh, my right God. On the grass. Awesome. He's just sitting there, and he's all, sorry, Flyers fans, suck it. It was awesome. <laughs> That's great. That is he's like, great. He's like an MLB player that is like a true fan of all sports. I he, love that. He was tweeting out from an A's game that he was at, you know, late last year and, and all that stuff. So he just kind of feels like one of those guys that – it's kind of like a one of us that yeah. just kind of made it to the pros. Yeah, like and a fan who got to, who gets to play in the big yeah. leagues. Awesome. It would be so great to see that guy come back to the Giants sometime later in his career and it would. and actually you know fit into a team. Maybe maybe uh, we you know Scudero moves on in a few years and we don't need a bunch of pop out of second base. We just need a solid guy. He might be the guy, you know, and it'd be cool to see him back. I like that guy a lot. My new favorite guy is going to be Guillermo Quiroz. Um, not just for his home run, but for the fact that I feel much better when he's catching than I did with Hector Sanchez. And I don't want to beat up on Hector Sanchez too much. I mean, we have beaten up on him a little bit on this podcast. But uh, Kuroz just has a much smoother demeanor, a much smoother way that he's catching the ball, that he's framing pitches. He just looks a lot better back there defensively. And I don't think we're giving up a lot offensively, especially the way that Sanchez have been hitting this year. 
Yeah. You know, he just seems to have a, a better approach at the plate than Sanchez does. And, uh, you know, and, and he's been around baseball a little bit. And he's, uh, you know, I think he's I think he's a quality guy to play backup for us right now. I mean, we've had some we've had some interesting backup catches over the years. And and I've liked quite a few of them. And I really like this guy as well. So I'm, I'm happy to see him up and I'm happy to see him contribute in such a in such a large way, especially with that home run. I mean, that was that was fantastic to see. And we love, you know, we love to see when the guys who nobody really expects it from have moments like that. You know, we're waiting for Noonan to have his walk off. It's time. Noonan, yeah. Well, he's a you know he's a six year journeyman, and so he's got a lot of major league experience under his uh, under his belt. So, you know, it's not a surprise to see his catching skills uh, have developed more than Hector Sanchez's. He's you know seven years older than him. So yeah, yeah. But he you know he just looks more comfortable back there. And yeah. uh, I was watching him catch the other day. I think it was was it Kane. He's catching Kane, and uh, he just, you know, he just if the ball's a little on the outside, the glove didn't move that much, you know, and it, it gives the guy a chance to get that call. So uh, yeah. By the way, uh, that was only his third career home run that he hit the other night. The walk-off. wow, wow, and he's got two hundred and seventy career at bats. So that's about one out of every ninety. At bats, he hits a home run, so he picked a good time to do that. Yeah, that's a long time coming right there. It's <laughs> a long wow. time. Wow, that's you know that's the thing. You come up in that spot. I don't think anyone's expecting you to hit a home run. They're trying to get ahead of you in the count. They're trying to you know say like, well, let's just go ahead and pitch the contact here, and uh, you know he just gets one on the sweet spot. Bang. Yep. All right, so let's hate on some people. Um, I'm gonna let you start this one, Chad. Who, you gonna, who are you gonna hate on right now? All right, a little bitter, but. Uh... The entire team of the San Antonio Spurs, All right. the refs, and whoever was assigned to cover Ginobili on yes. that two-pointer. Well, I can tell you exactly what happened with that play. Um, Bazemore I saw a double team. Like Bazemore, two yeah. Over. Bazemore was the guy who ended up looking like he had covered the wrong guy. But he was just but, pulling it. Well, actually, what happened was uh, Jared Jack and Harrison Barnes both uh, came to cover Tony Parker. Mm-hmm. So they had two guys covering Tony Parker. And Bazemore was stuck between having to cover Boris Dia, who was uh, going down the lane, or Ginobili, where if he doesn't cover uh, Boris, he gives up an easy layup. Yeah, We're only up by one. Layup, yeah. And if he doesn't cover Ginobili, he gives up wide open three. So Bazemore actually made the right call. And then he actually made an incredible play to even get over and challenge the three mm-hmm. uh, because he actually got a hand in his face. So even though it was a wide open three, he got to set up really nicely. Bazemore, you know, he's an athletic guy and he's a really good defender. And he came over there and he got a hand in his face. And it was really, uh, it was Jack or, or Barnes. One of those guys was supposed to stay on Ginobili. And they both cut and went and covered Parker. So it was just a just a poorly executed defensive play there. I mean, you know, and then part of that is the way that Mark Jackson tells him to go out there and, and do the play. I mean, he was telling them basically to switch on all cuts and um, and picks and stuff. And, you know, when, when you have all these switches, it's, you know, it creates possibility for confusion. So, yep, you know, yep, yep. I, I, you know honestly, I think in that situation, what you do is you, you put, you know, I think I personally would like to see Bogut in the game at that point. Uh, sure. Which he wasn't in the game. And I'd like to see him under the basket, just waiting for someone to, you know, attack the rim. And then you space out around the three point line, um, you know, and try to deny the ball a little. But I think really you just try to make the shot harder because there's four seconds left. They have one chance. So make the shot as hard as possible. You know what and I mean? And you can't foul. So you got yeah, you you to stay out of their face, basically. Yeah, exactly. You can't foul. Nah, so was denying the ball you know, is tough, You got to give credit to Ginobili. He missed every three in the game until yeah, that last until one. That and one and right it's there. like, yeah. man, you know, there's a pressure shot and he made it. So yeah, kudos yeah. to him, I yeah, guess. Yeah, he still got that weird bald spot, though. So Yeah, it's kind of strange. A little monkey <laughs> thing going on. All right. I'm going to uh, I'm gonna hate on God because Mark Jackson. <laughs> wait, wait. Lightning. Are you there? Is lightning struck you? No, no, it hasn't happened, dude. It has not happened. Have you been forced? out the window mysteriously. I, I'm going to hate on God because uh, Mark Jackson gives all credit to God and all glory to God, even when the yeah. guy asked him a question about, you know, uh, how the team played. Then he just deflects the question and says, oh, all glory to God. Like, okay, buddy, can we just answer the question that you just got asked, please? <laughs> Don't just, like, choose this as a time to try to give a sermon. But, uh, hey, if God helped us win all those games, then this one must be on God, too. So God, yeah, God uh, is a Warriors fan, as we all know. <laughs> yeah, excellent. So God decided to make us lose uh, an 18-point lead in the fourth quarter, and 
And uh, God decided to have Ginobili's three go in there with four seconds left. Uh, and Some there you teams go. don't even score 18 points in the fourth quarter. I know. Well, I still don't understand that. If we're a defensive team, we should be able to prevent with... I mean, they scored eight points in a minute and 20 seconds. You know, they basically closed the entire gap within, I think, three minutes. You know, I mean, it was... Well, it was a 16-point lead with three-something left. But here's the thing. They were leading 104 to 88. 104 to 88. And then they tied at 106 to go in overtime. Yeah, so we scored what? two points. They scored two points? Yeah. So with six 18? minutes left or so? It was two yeah, points in can't. six yeah. minutes? That's no. terrible. That's awful. And, the, and you know, Sorry. I mean, Steph Curry all of a sudden went cold. But, again, he played the entire game. Give this, give the kid a little rest. You know, give him those like end of the first quarter, end of the third quarter blows where you get, you know, you get him out with about a minute left or so, yeah. And then he gets an extended break. I mean, get, we need him at the end of the games. We can't have him just be this guy who goes crazy every third quarter. So that seems what happens. He goes nuts in every third quarter, and then uh, come fourth quarter time, he's he's tired, man. He's I I could see it. The shots were flat. They're hitting the front of the rim. So yeah. you know, I mean, that's just to me. I mean. It's, I'm sorry. I like Mark Jackson a lot in a lot of ways, but dude, he's still he's still got a lot to learn as as a head coach. I'm I'm just I'm just gonna put that out there. All right, why will we win it all? Let's talk about the Giants again. Uh, all right, their offense is doing great right now. So if they're starting pitching, really turns it around to their classic Giants form. You know, being number two, three, four in ERA, they're gonna be almost unstoppable in the regular season. I mean, anything can happen in the playoffs, but. Man, they are looking good right now. Absolutely. I, yeah, if our starting pitching gets to even partially where it's supposed to be, we're going to run away with this thing. You know, I mean, right now our starting pitching is absolutely struggling in a way that we really haven't seen in a long time. Uh, towards the end of the season, September of last year, we saw this for a little bit. But uh, not in April, not in May, we haven't seen this. So. No. Yeah, starting pitching gets just at all going, and uh, we're going to run away with this division for sure. All right, uh, I'm going to go ahead and say that, again, offense. It's weird that we're talking about offense on this show right now. This is not synonymous with the Giants. No, no, no this has not been where the Giants have been in, in psh, wow, since Bonds left, basically. I mean, 2002 was the last time I can remember us being a real offensive powerhouse, and uh Right now, we seem to be a team that is capable of coming back in any ball game, and I'm I'm expecting three run homers now. All of a sudden, <laughs> you know, and that's not something I I ever thought was going to happen before. I mean, it was, you remember the t the stretch of time where we had something like twenty something solo home runs in a row without mm -hmm. before we finally hit one with somebody on base. I mean, that's not what's happening now. Now guys are teeing off with the bases juiced, and it's fantastic. So. Uh, keep that rolling. Giants, you're never out of any ball game, and uh, that's why we will win it all. All right, Chad, we really we really rocked through this one. That was good. Little it's, little caffeine-infused uh, warrior loss. Infused, yeah. Uh, well, speed edition. We decided, light. we decided to not start the, the podcast until the game was over, which <laughs> honestly... That game was worth watching every second of. I no, mean, it was, even though it was a loss. It yeah, was, it even was though it was exciting. a loss. It's going to go down in NBA history as one of the better games. So. Yeah, a double overtime game where at the end we're up one with four seconds left. I mean, come on. That was, I mean, Bazemore scores that go-ahead bucket, too. Holy yeah. crap, was that, did that come out of nowhere? But, I mean, anyway, so we started this really late. And uh, we just wanted to get through it, and we wanted to get you guys a show. We don't want to skip any more shows. So I uh, had to get in there. had to talk about the Giants, especially after winning six in a row. Really looking forward to uh, to the rest of this series that we got against um, against the Phillies. We haven't seen them in a while, so um, looking forward to the rest of that. And uh, we'll be back next week. I want to thank everybody for listening to this very, very short, very, very down, bitter, maybe a little bit episode of the Torture Cast, episode 47, the Rod Beck episode. If you want to follow us on Twitter, you can find us at TortureCast. You can also follow each one of us individually. Chad is at ChadK21. Ben, who is not here tonight, is at Fried Duck. Me, Willie Dills, is at Willie Dills. You can also find our blog at TortureCast.com. Uh, torture Chad, you actually just posted a new one. Um, last week, right? So yes, blog I did. Post to check out there. So, so go check ahead. that out. Yeah, go ahead and read that. Little breakdown on vocal song. Leave some comments if you want to. Uh, I want to also uh, give another give another quick bump to uh, two out hits. That guy was fantastic on the show last week. So go check him out. 
Um, and uh, there you go. That's going to do it. Oh, check, uh, like us on Facebook. Donate if you want to using the PayPal button on our on our uh, podcast page. All right. For the yeah, send in questions, comments, naked pictures, anything you want. <laughs> Absolutely. We take it all. Uh, so for the absent Ben Lee and the present Chad King, my name is Willie Dills, and we'll see you next time. Boom. A big thank you to everybody for listening to the Torture Cast, the podcast by and for fans of the San Francisco Giants. Follow us on Twitter at TortureCast. You can also like us on Facebook or check out our blog at TortureCast.com. I also want to say thank you to Ashcon and Bailey for letting us use their song Feeling Like a Giant for our intro. For Ben Lee and Chad King, my name is Willie Dills saying we'll see you next time. <laughs>